And um, those five votes were found in a wastebasket. So I pursued trying to get something done about it, and then I soon discovered there was no election law enforcement whatsoever. <laughs> and it was a nightmare, and that's, a, that's the point where I thought, well, you know, we really have to change this mess. Um, so we formed the Michigan Election Reform Alliance, and we have been working very hard since 2004. Uh, many of our people tried to go to Ohio and help, and <laughs> it turned out there was nothing they could do. Uh, and then we discovered, boy, it could happen in our state just as easily. Next slide. So we are in a state of denial in Michigan, as are a lot of states. <laughs> um, we, uh, we're under a Stalinist kind of regime, uh, very much like my friend and colleague Karen McKim in Wisconsin. Both of our states uh, were progressive states for many, many years. Uh, we had very honest and, uh, and high-level government, quality, good government. Um, and then we became a victim of the Help America Vote Act and the Bob Ney scam. And we've <clears throat> gone straight downhill um, along with what happened in 2010. Next slide. And this is where we're at. <laughs> so, um, next slide. In Michigan, we can no longer count our votes. We really can't. It, it's just ridiculous. Uh, we had the closest presidential margin in the country, uh, a margin of 10,704 votes. That's 0.22% uh, of the 4.8 million votes that were cast. That's just infinitesimally small. And our vote tabulators have a demonstrated error rate of at least 0.26% up to 5%, and I'll tell you how I know that. So, who did elect the president? Next slide. According to Jeff Greenfield, a total of 1 30th of 1% of the votes in three states decided the election. But we're never gonna know who really won. There's just no way we can. Michigan's recount was stopped halfway through by a court order Pennsylvania's could never get going. And of course, Karen's gonna tell you what happened in Wisconsin. Next slide. In other states, a statewide recount is, is often automatic if you have a margin that is under 3%. That's because somebody thought a recount was in the public interest. And it should be at public expense. It's, it's to everyone's benefit to know what really happened. Michigan's trigger is only 2,000 votes in a state that casts up to 9 million. Since 2000, the year 2000, the only race we've had that was anywhere close to this was a state attorney general race. There's just nothing else that ever comes that close. So what happens is candidates are forced to file for recounts at considerable expense. Depending on how close the margin is, they they pay $25 a precinct or $125 a precinct, which is what Jill Stein had to pay. So Michigan election officials have, uh, have had a field day wrongly interpreting the state law and recounts. So the 2016 recount would not have produced a useful <clears throat> result in our state even if it had gone to conclusion. Both Karen and I had the awful experience of being totally ignored by the Stein recount people. We wanted to advise them on how they should pursue this to not get screwed by this misinterpretation. But nobody was listening to us chickens. And they went ahead and they spent a lot of time and a lot of money, uh, and they could have done it much better. In fact, Phil Stark had suggested that the state could have done uh, a, a, an audit and only had to count about 660,000 votes, not over 4 million, to get a reliable 
and trustworthy assessment of what happened. But of course, they weren't going to do that either. When you file for a recount in Michigan, you say simply on boilerplate that you think mistake and fraud have occurred. You don't have to prove it. You don't have to detail it. That's just what you're saying. And it's a catch-22. <laughs> because the way they've reinterpreted the recount rules that were promulgated in 1979, next slide. Next slide. You can't recount a precinct if the ballot case seal is missing. You can't if uh, it has a different number from the one that was recorded in the poll book, which often happens when people are tired at two in the morning. You can't recount a precinct if the number of ballots in the ballot case differs, if only by one, from the number recorded in the poll book statement of votes. One off. Done. It goes in the record book, just like a baseball game. Next slide. Then they decided on the sites where we were holding the recounts, and Richard was there for some of this. We call it the recount follies. Observers who were pledged to any of the six candidates on the ballot for president may not see other election documents, which is not true. So you could not see the tabulator totals tapes, which were there. You might want to look at them yourself. You could not see the poll book voter lists or any of the other records. We don't have time, they said. We don't have time? What do you mean? Uh, they enforced this in the Wayne County recount where I was, even though I had gone up to the director of Bureau of Elections and said, he says that you told him to do this. Is that what you said? And Chris Thomas said, no way, I never said that. So I got the two of them together. Yeah, that was so much fun. <laughs> the general counsel for Wayne County and the state director of elections, because he was lying. He was just out and out lying to me as an observer. Next slide. So this is an Alice in Wonderland scenario, <laughs> because if, a, a, if you use the same logic in a bank robbery, if the bank were robbed, and then the missing money caused the bank's financial records to become incomplete or incorrect, then the police could not investigate the robbery. <laughs> Next slide. <laughs> Next slide. So this is a perfect situation for fraud. You know, commit fraud, cover it up with mistakes, and then you're done. Um, the, the boilerplate on the petition does not in any way put a burden on the petitioner. So uh, all that Stein or any of the other candidates had to say was, we think there was mistake or fraud. However, that's not what the judges said later. The law also provides a county board of canvassers with the authority to conduct a criminal investigation. That's really what this was written to be. The smart people in the 50s who wrote this law knew exactly what they were doing. Next slide. In 2014, my organization wrote a report called Facing Michigan's Election Cliff, and it's on our website. You can read the whole thing. We predicted all the things that were going to happen in 2016, including tabulators jamming, failing to scan, obsolete memory cards failing. In Detroit, 30% of the optical scanners failed. That's out of 700 scanners, 30%. Voters were forced to wait for at least an hour while the machines were repaired or co totally replaced on election day. And the, the city clerk's office was completely unprepared for this, as were other cities where this happened. It wasn't just Detroit, but it was the most blatant in Detroit. Next slide. Um, so after this whole disaster, and I should mention, because you're, but you're probably aware of it, that Trump sued in state court to stop the recount, saying that it was all because Stein had no chance to win. Why were we doing this? And ultimately, that is the basis for this, the court decision. Even though there is no basis in Michigan law, you don't have to have a chance to win to get a recount. You're entitled to a recount, period. 
So in essence, what happened was we got a terrible ex instance of case law, which we hope will not hold in the future. Um, and so we worked uh, after this horror uh, with many people in this room and we did uh, a lot of investigation of violations, including we collected all the observers' reports from all around the state. We had analyzed them. Um, we gave a detailed report to the United States Attorney for the Eastern District, Barb McQuaid. You may have seen her on Rachel Maddow, now that she's been canned by Trump. Um, but her civil rights department head is still there. <laughs> Um, and we also presented a report to the FBI. I spent a two-hour interview with the Detroit FBI detailing all the things that had gone wrong and how they were violations of federal law. And just to give you a real quick rundown, the Voting Rights Act, of course, was violated big time, uh, uh, demonstrating vast underfunding of elections in majority-minority cities, which had the most machine breakdowns, the worst problems. Uh, 30 to 50 percent of precincts in Wayne County were <laughs> declared too compromised to be recountable. There were massive violations of the National Voter Registration Act of 1993. High rates of voters forced to use provisional envelope ballots, which is just totally not necessary. We don't do that in Michigan. If you're an election administrator and you have that happen, shame on you. You were supposed to get that voter to the place where they could vote a real ballot. We consider that a mark of shame. Help America Vote Act. If, to the extent that it ever set up any standards for voting equipment, we, we saw a massive failure of maintenance of machines to meet those standards. And I, I won't go into that, but I can tell you that our gambling commission does a far better job of maintaining the one-armed bandits than our election administration does of our voting machines. And they have 100 people who do nothing but that. We also think there was violation of RICO. And uh, next slide. So we had uh, all these voting precincts with 12 to 14 year old machines with mechanical parts all worn out. How did that happen? Why? why why didn't anybody have to, have to think about this? And then we have the Secretary of State this year arbitrarily decreeing a replacement program with only five brands available. Hardly any clerks have been consulted. And it sure looks funny to me when you've got some favoritism going on with certain machine manufacturers, even though all of them are, are ranked horrible on security problems. Next slide. So my mention of RICO is not complete by failing to talk about the fact that in Michigan there are two contractors who program every ballot and every memory card in the state for 83 counties, possibly save one where they still do their own. Now these two contractors, how did they get that nice comfy corner on the market? These people are are not supervised, they are unsworn to uphold the Constitution and the laws. Nobody is watching when they plug into the internet. What is to stop malware from migrating right onto the whole state system? And people say, oh, well, we're not connected to the internet. <laughs> really? <laughs> so that's, there's, a, there's plenty of public corruption to go around, and I, I would love to tell you a lot more about that. And then there were violations of constitutional protections, and of course, Bush v. Gore. So th that's, that's what we learned from our half-done recount. Um, Mira has a study that we did that's on our website. We, we did, we photographed 35, over 35,000 ballots in one county, and we hand audited them. And from that, we found some really eye-opening things <laughs> about scanners and their error rates. And if you want to know more about that, you can look at our report. It's very detailed. For those of you that think that scanners are the answer, think again. <laughs> to know them is not to love them. Um, 
just egregious numerous failures of ballot security, ballot accounting also have occurred. Uh, it, it's, it just boggles the mind how this, this happens when we started 15 years ago with a really reliable, good system, diverse all over the state, run by little blue-haired ladies, God love them, and now where are we? Next slide. So you can look at, our, at the error rates that we found in the current round of purchasing, which will cost the state $65 million for machines that are warranted for eight years. <laughs> eight piddly years. Not one gives any guarantee of accuracy on election day. No guarantee at all. Even the one-armed bandits come with a better guarantee. Next slide. We think close elections are really important. <laughs> We'd like to be more accurate. And I have some just real quick stuff about, in our state, we've had judicial races that were within 1%. Uh, we even had a congressional race that was 0.46% in 2012. And you know what? The machines probably decided that race and helped change the composition of Congress. So do we want the machines to be deciding? Next slide. Next slide, that's, that's my beginning illustrator map. We have three things that we're working on right now, and we're, we're really putting our eggs in these baskets. We are really trying to get a blue ribbon commission on elect, election integrity. And we're working very hard to get support from both sides of the aisle. So far, we've got a little bit, <laughs> uh, which would do Colorado, California, you've done some comprehensive reviews where you had public hearings, you had public input. We'd really like to get the public involved since they're the ones who do the voting. Uh, we want cost comparisons made. Why are we spending $65 million on 1970s computer junk? Is this really getting our money's worth? Next slide. We have a bill that's just about to be introduced that we've worked on for years with the help of the election audits working group that will establish an audit authority under a separate branch, not under the election administrator. <laughs> That's where you're getting in trouble in California. Uh, we want to follow national guidelines. Uh, we've got a, a f basically a four-tiered system for the audits. And um, we would provide for escalation to a full recount if warranted. Next slide. And right now, we're also working on an independent nonpartisan redistricting commission uh, with some elements that you would recognize from the California effort. Uh, we have a signature campaign underway right now. We're two months into it, and we have 200,000 signatures. So, <laughs> and I have to say, God love millennials. They, they are busting themselves all over the state, and we've got four months to go to get the other 150,000, so I'm, it's going to be on the ballot. Uh, the antis are already attacking us. This is totally nonpartisan. We have no endorsements from parties. We won't let them. They can attack us, but they can't endorse us. Um, and it's uh, 11 parts of our Constitution are involved. And uh, we had to do that because we had to build firewalls against partisan manipulation because, as you know, the Mackinac Center and the, and, and the Cokes go, they spend their nights trying to figure out how to undermine nonpartisan commissions. Next slide. Uh, you can just skip this one, go ahead. So we are appealing to everybody to help us, everybody around our state. Uh, we got to get more bill sponsors. We need people who are willing to come to public hearings and make personal statements. We're also uh, trying to find more ways to get people involved. We have a Mira Monitors program where we teach people how to be election challengers. And that has done a huge amount of good in Detroit where we have an army of people watching the elections there where before they were getting stolen every four years. And um, next slide. So if you need to contact me, or any of the other people on our board with questions. Michigan Election Reform Alliance, all of our board members are listed there, or call me. Thank you very much.
five minutes for questions. Anyone have specific questions? Can you hold that slide, Matt? Not talk about the five minutes for questions, but we're going to give you All right. Proceed. If you've already asked the question, if you just allow it. Go ahead. I would say your name. Thank you so much for the presentation and for the fantastic work that you've been doing, Jan. My name is Emily Levy. I'm from the Bay Area here. And one of the task force members for Recount Now. Yes. Um, and my question is, what have you done to get people involved that has been successful? Because I know that's something many of us struggle with in organizations all over the country working on these issues. We feel very strongly about our Mira Monitors program. We want to have armies of people who go in in every election, and that's local as well as, as state and national. And uh, the training is about three hours. We teach them basically how elections should be run and how they're not being run. How do you find them? How do you get them uh, in? We, go in, we ask our local contacts, find people who are willing to spend election day going from precinct to precinct. We have a checklist. It's on our website. Uh, we write a report after each election. Uh, I mean, we've just found egregious things, like a stack of blank ballots sitting in the middle of the room where anybody could pick up a few. You know, people voting with pencils, that's illegal. Uh, and we've actually had clerks come up to our people now and say, am I doing this right? <laughs> so the, the, the election monitors are really important because you get a group of people who really know how stuff is supposed to be done. And so they know when it's wrong and they stop it. We've stopped a whole bunch of things. In Benton Harbor, Michigan, after our challengers came in in 2009, they said it was the first honest election they'd had in 30 years. Uh, you mentioned the bad um, court precedent. Uh, about Trump versus Jill Stein in Michigan. Do you have a strategy for trying to set a different uh, precedent? Should there be a case brought in a different part of the country on the same issue to, to promote a, a recount and establish a different precedent? Well, it's very dependent on what particular states say about that. Uh, we had a really good law. Anybody can file for a recount, and you didn't have to say you would win if you got so many more votes. Uh, so that precedent, we're, we're, we're preparing to defeat it if it comes a, a, up in another case. Um, Paul Stevenson, who is the co-chair of the Justice Caucus, uh, and uh, one of the few attorneys these days who really knows election law in, in Michigan and has won cases, um, we're hoping that he, he's going to follow through on preparing a team to be ready for that, because that would just be horrible. Recounts are one of the few things we have left. <laughs> when they work, they're really very valuable. Well, thank you, everybody. It's been a pleasure to be here.